So the title of my talk is Hamiltonian Complexity in the Thermodynamic Limit, and this is joint work with Dorit Aharonov. So the field of quantum Hamiltonian complexity is basically focused on the local Hamiltonian problem. And you're given as input a system of n d-dimensional particles and a Hermitian operator h that acts on the system. And h is a sum of local terms, meaning that it's a sum of terms, each of which acts non-trivially on a small number of particles. You're also given two thresholds separated by one over a polynomial. And the goal is to understand the value of the lowest eigenvalue of this matrix. So you accept if that lowest eigenvalue is less than A and reject if it's greater than B. If you're unfamiliar with the local Hamiltonian problem, you can just basically think of it as a quantum version of constraint satisfaction. So you're given a set of N variables, each of which can take on one of D different values, an overall cost function. And the cost function is just a sum of terms and each term is a function on L variables. And you wanna know the minimum cost assignment, is it less than A or is it greater than or equal to B? So the local Hamiltonian problem has a broad appeal to computer scientists because it's a natural quantum extension of a problem that's very fundamental to computer science. At the same time, it's also a fundamental problem in numerical condensed matter physics. So the Hamiltonian H represents the overall energy of the system and it's a sum of terms, and these terms represent the local interaction between particles in the system. And it's of great interest in physics to understand the properties of the lowest possible energy state. So the quantum state that minimizes the energy, and that's the lowest eigenvalue of this matrix. So the ground state tells you a lot about the physics of the problem, and a lot of the interesting physics happens at this low energy regime. So this problem is really fundamental in both computer science and physics. When Kantayev introduced the local Hamiltonian problem, he also proved that this problem is QMA complete. And the class QMA is in some sense a quantum version of NP, um, but there are some important differences. So first of all, QMA is a class of promise problems, not languages. So a problem partitions the set of all binary strings into three classes, accept, reject, and invalid. So a problem is in QMA, if there's a polynomial time quantum verifier for the strings in the accept class, there exists a quantum witness that will cause the verifier to accept with high probability. If X is in the reject class, then no matter what quantum witness you provide to the verifier, it will reject with high probability. And this quantum witness is a state on a polynomial number of qubits. And importantly, if X is in the invalid class, then there are no guarantees whatsoever for what the verifier will do. So in our local Hamiltonian problem, an example of an invalid instance would be one in which the ground state or the ground energy of the Hamiltonian lies in between the two given thresholds. So Kataev's original construction in which he proved that the local Hamiltonian problem is QMA hard was non-physical for a number of reasons, meaning that it deviated from the type of systems typically studied in physics. So for example, it was non-translationally invariant meaning that the individual terms of each particle were particular to the particles. And typically in a physical system, the energy interaction between pairs of particles is exactly the same. So typically one studies a system in which the energetics between pairs is identical. Also, Taev's construction was not geometrically local. So each individual term did only apply to a small number of qubits. That didn't necessarily imply that there's an embedding of those particles in some geometric space in which only particles that are close to each other interact. Dive's construction was also five local, and many of the systems studied in physics are actually two local between pairs of interacting particles. So QMA hardness results have been strengthened in a number of ways since Kataya's original result. We now know that local Hamiltonian remains QMA complete, even in the following situations, two local qubits on a 2D grid, two local even on a one-dimensional line, and even translationally invariant systems in one dimensions. All of these problems, however, still examine finite systems. So they're asking about the complexity of computing the ground energy as a function of the size of the system. In physics, however, the focus is typically on the thermodynamic limit. In other words, what you're interested in is the properties of the ground state as the size of the system grows to infinity. So this is naturally gonna be a translationally invariant system since you can't specify the local term on every edge in an infinite system. 
So typically there's a different term for every grid dimension. So I've drawn a 2D system here, and you can imagine one term being applied to every pair of particles in the X direction, and another term being applied to every pair of particles in the Y direction. And what we're interested in is the energy density in the thermodynamic limit. So if we let H of N be the Hamiltonian on a finite N by N grid, and we're looking here now at the minimum energy per particle. So we're taking the minimum energy of the system and dividing by the number of particles and then letting N go to infinity. And this is the quantity of interest, which is the energy per particle in the thermodynamic limit. So there are some results on the computational complexity of quantum systems in the thermodynamic limit. In particular, there was a breakthrough result in 2015 by Qubit, Perez, Garcia, and Wolf and they show that given a Hamiltonian term H or two terms for two dimensional systems, it's undecidable to determine the spectral gap of H applied in the thermodynamic limit. So there is also a complexity result about computing ground energy in the thermodynamic limit. So consider the problem in which you're given a Hamiltonian term H and an integer N which describes sort of the precision of the system and you want to know the ground energy density resulting from applying this term H to every pair of particles on an infinite 1D chain. Specifically, you wanna know whether it's less than or greater than two thresholds defined by polynomials that are fixed parameters of the problem. So we know that this problem is QMA X complete. And QMA X is the same as QMA, except the quantum verifier now has exponential time and gets a quantum witness that's exponentially long in the size of the input. The problem didn't get harder, the input just got smaller. So typically in a local Hamiltonian problem, the number of bits required to specify an instance scales with the size of the system. Here, the input N is logarithmic in the size of the system required to answer this question. So the question we ask here is, does it really make sense to study the ground energy density in the thermodynamic limit as a function of the Hamiltonian itself? So typically in physics, you think of each Hamiltonian term H as a separate problem. One studies, for example, the Hubbard model or the Ising model. And each of these is considered a completely different problem. So a more natural version of this problem would have H be a fixed parameter of the system and then just ask about the properties of the ground energy density in the thermodynamic limit. So results on translationally invariant systems in the literature have come in two different varieties, and it's worth pointing out this difference here. In one version of the problem, the Hamiltonian term H is given as part of the input. So H is variable. And in another stronger version of the translation invariance, H is a fixed parameter of the problem, and the only input to the problem is N, the size of the system given in binary. Now, if we move to infinite systems, the first version of the problem still has an infinite family of Hamiltonians because you have an infinite set of different possible input terms each. In the second version of the problem, there's really only one Hamiltonian. You fix the Hamiltonian term H, you're asking about the ground energy density in the thermodynamic limit, and this is really just a single number. So it begs the question of how you even study the complexity of a problem in which the answer is just one single number. So I'm gonna define the problem in two dimensions because that's what we study in this paper. So we have Hamiltonian terms H row and H column and the resulting Hamiltonian from applying these two terms on an N by N grid. This is the ground energy per particle for a system of size N by N. And we're interested in this quantity as N goes to infinity. So the problem that we study is the function version of this problem. H row and H column are fixed parameters of the problem. The only input to the problem is N, which is the desired precision of the output. And the task is to output a number that's within one over two to the N of the true ground energy density. So what N is indicating here is the desired number of bits of precision in the approximation of alpha naught. And what we show is that the function version of GED is contained in this class, function x to the QMA x, and it's hard for function x to the next under Karp reductions. So there are a lot of complexity classes here, so let's unpack this a little bit. Function x is the set of functions computable by an exponential time classical Turing machine. The upper bound uses an oracle to a QMA x problem. So yes, instances can be verified 
in exponential time by a quantum verifier with an exponential size quantum witness. The lower bound, on the other hand, is a classical complexity class. So we prove hardness when the oracle is NEXP, which is the set of languages in which yes instances can be verified in exponential time by a classical verifier. So notice that the results aren't tight. We're giving a quantum construction and proving hardness for a classical complexity class. And the construction can actually handle quantum verifiers and quantum witnesses. The difficulty arises in handling invalid instances. So notice that NEXP is a class of languages, not promise problems. So we've avoided the problem of having invalid instances. And I'll say more about this at the end of the talk. So to better understand where this Oracle complexity class comes from, let's take a look at the upper bound. So we're gonna compute the function version of GD. We have an exponential time Turing machine with access to an Oracle for QMA exp. And the Oracle that we're gonna use is a decision version of QED. So in this version of the problem, you're given a threshold alpha specified with n bits, and you wanna accept if the ground energy density is at most alpha and reject if it's greater than alpha plus one over to the n. So now the function version is just uses binary search querying the decision version. There's a little bit of a subtlety in the fact that the queries have this promise gap, but it's not too hard to show that two queries can reduce the size of the interval in the binary search by a factor of one half. So just to summarize here, the input is n specified with log n bits. And this is the desired precision. Each iteration of binary search gives you one more bit of precision. So we need O of n iterations, which is exponential time. And that's where this function exponential comes from in the complexity class. The query precision required is one over two to the n. So we need the Oracle class QMA exp as a result. So that's where the double exponential comes from, one in the function exp and the other in the query Oracle. So now we turn to the hardness result, which is really where the technical beat of the paper is. So to prove the hardness, we have to take a generic function in this class, function x to the next, and reduce it to function GED. So as we've observed, the function GED is just a single number. So how do we express an entire function whose value is defined on every possible binary string and express that whole infinite function in a single number. So the idea is that we encode the output for different inputs of f in different portions of the infinite binary representation of alpha naught. So different portions of this infinite string representing alpha naught represent the output of f on different values of x. So this is an appropriate time to pause and put in a plug for the paper that will be presented after us in the conference due to James Watson and Toby Cubitt they examine a problem that's very similar to the one that we look at. In their version, they also have two particle Hamiltonian terms that are fixed parameter of the problem. But in their case, they're looking at the version of the problem in which the input gives you two thresholds separated by an exponential. And they are also interested in computing this ground state energy density, but now this is a decision problem. They wanna know if alpha naught is at most A or at least B. And they tackle this problem by looking at the class of languages solvable by an exponential time Turing machine with access to an oracle to ground state energy density. So in other words, they're using Turing reductions. And they show that this class is sandwiched in between x to the next and p to the n double exponential. So besides the fact that they use Turing reductions, these results also aren't quite tight because these two complexity classes sandwiching their ground state energy density problem are not equal. On the other hand, they use a classical construction. So they're proving the hardness of a classical construction with a classical complexity class, whereas if we're proving the hardness of a quantum construction with a classical complexity class. So if I were to describe the relationship between the two papers, we really set out independently to solve the same problem. We encountered exactly the same difficulty, which is proving hardness results when the Oracle class is a promise problem. And we compromised in completely different ways. So as a result, the results and the problems and the techniques are quite different between the two papers. So both papers make use of a technique pioneered by Qubit, Perez, Garcia, and Wolf that used Robinson tiling, which dates back to the early seventies. 
So Robinson tiles are a finite set of tiling rules that if they're applied in the infinite plane and none of the tiling rules are violated, it creates an aperiodic structure. So for k greater, so for every k greater than one, the resulting tiling has squares of size four to the k, and the density of the occurrence of squares of a particular size is inversely proportional to the size. So here's a picture here of a Robinson tiling. And the important point for us is a set of tiling rules is essentially a classical Hamiltonian. So the Robinson tiling then gives us an infrastructure on which to layer a different construction. So layer one is the tiling rules for the Robinson tiles. And layer two is a 1D translationally invariant Hamiltonian for finite chains that's applied to the top row of every square. So what this gives us is an infinite sequence of finite systems. So at the end of the day, the lowest energy state is gonna respect all the tiling rules, giving us this Robinson structure. And the ground energy density will be the sum of the ground energy density for an infinite sequence of 1D chains, each of which has length four to the K. So this minimum energy eigenvalue for a finite system is divided by the density at which those squares appear in the Robinson tiling. So alpha naught is this infinite sum of the minimum energy values for a sequence of finite systems. So here's a schematic representation of the sum. It's an infinite sum over k equals one to infinity, the ground energy for a 1D chain of length four to the k. And each of these values is shifted by a certain amount that depends on k. So we actually only use squares that are of the form four to the k, where k is a perfect square. And this gives us a little bit more real estate in the binary representation of alpha naught. And the leading bits of the minimum eigenvalue for the finite system of size four to the x squared encodes the value of f of x. So if we can compute alpha naught to a given level of precision, this will allow us to uncover these leading bits and determine the value of f of x. So what we've basically done now is take the function version of translation varying Hamiltonian in the thermodynamic limit and reduced it to a finite problem, which we think is interesting in its own right. So here's the finite version. We have problem parameters, Hamiltonian term, and a constant. The input is n, the size of the system given in binary. And the function version asks for a value of lambda that's within one over a polynomial so uh, h of n is the translationally invariant chain. It's a chain of length n, and the term h is applied to every pair of neighboring particles in the chain. And we prove the following theorem. Function tih is an fp to the qma exp, and function tih is hard for fp to the next under Karp reductions. And again, we have the same issue that we have a quantum construction and are proving hardness for a classical complexity class. The decision version of this problem is known to be QMAX complete. So it will be useful to understand how to approve a hardness result for an Oracle complexity class in the more familiar terrain of NP. So consider the following Boolean optimization problem. The input is M clauses on N Boolean variables and a weight for each clause. The cost of a particular assignment to those Boolean variables is the weighted sum of the violated clauses. So each CI is zero, one, depending on whether the clause is satisfied and we're multiplying it times its weight. You can imagine a decision version of this problem in which you're given a threshold and you're asking whether the minimum cost is the most T, a function version in which you're just asked to compute the minimum cost, and a decision version of the optimization problem in which you're asked about some feature of the minimum cost solution. And I included this to emphasize the point that the important distinction isn't the fact that this is a decision problem versus a function problem, but the function problem is asking for a property of the minimum cost solution, as opposed to whether it's just less than some threshold. So the decision problem is NP complete. The function version is FP to the NP complete. And the decision optimization version is P to the NP complete. So let's take a closer look at how the hardness result is proved for the function version of the problem. So we have a generic function in FP to the NP. So F is computed by a polynomial time Turing machine with access to a SAT oracle. So we take as input X, 
And we have to reduce it to an instance of weighted sat so that the solution for weighted sat will give us the value of the function. And the difficulty here is that this computation of M is actually a conversation with an oracle. And this single instance of weighted sat needs to encode this entire conversation and verify the response of all of the oracle queries. So we can imagine M's computation as a function of X, the input, and the string of all the oracle responses. If the oracle responses are fixed, then all of the queries are also fixed. So we can encode the computation of M on input X with oracle responses Y in an instance of weighted Boolean sat. But the thing is that the Boolean sat now needs to somehow have an accounting scheme or a cost in which it rewards the correct string of oracle responses. And we use a method developed by Krentel in 1986, in which he proved that weighted sat is hard for fp to the np. So if the guess on the ith oracle is that the response is yes, we can encode the sat verifier on that particular instance and have a large cost in the case of rejection. So this will introduce a large penalty if we have an incorrect yes guess. The problem is, of course, is that you can't verify no guesses. So what Krentel does is he introduces a more modest cost for no guesses to disincentivize no guesses. So there's a large catastrophic cost in the case of an incorrect yes guess and a more modest cost in the case of just a no guess, whether it's correct or not. Now the queries are adapted. So these costs necessarily have to decrease exponentially. In other words, it's important that the cost of an incorrect no guess on the ith query is bigger than anything you would gain in any of the future queries. And Krentel proved that if you employ this scheme, the minimum Y is achieved for the correct set of guesses. So let's return to our function translationally invariant problem. We have parameters H and C, and we need to compute a good estimate of the ground energy. So we have to take a generic function in FP to the next, translate that into a system size, so that if we can estimate the lowest energy eigenvalue for that system, we can then determine the value of f on input x. The problem is that Krentel's accounting scheme requires an exponential number of different costs in order to implement this exponentially decreasing accounting scheme. And we can't hard code those costs into the Hamiltonian itself because we have a fixed Hamiltonian term that's fixed in size and can't depend on x, the input. So we use the circuit to Hamiltonian construction invented by Katayev back in his original QMA hardness result. And this consists of a propagation Hamiltonian that ensures that the ground state is this computation state where part of the Hilbert space represents the value of a clock and the other part of the Hilbert space encodes the state of the computation. So the ground state of this Hamiltonian is a uniform position over all points in time, the clock state, tensored with the state of the computation after t steps. Now in a typical circuit to Hamiltonian construction, this propagation Hamiltonian is one half times the Laplacian of a path. So this results in this uniform superposition. And there's a plus one diagonal cost if the computation rejects. And what this essentially gives you is that the lowest eigenvalue of the matrix is one over a polynomial times the probability of rejection. So if you can determine this lowest eigenvalue, you can determine whether the verifier accepts or not. Our construction is similar, but uses now a cyclical clock. So the propagation Hamiltonian is one half the Laplacian of a cycle. And we introduce this penalty structure for every single computation. So now we're computing a function. There's no longer a notion of accepting or rejecting and every computation has this penalty. We prove that the lowest eigenvalue of the sum of these two matrices is exactly this value that depends on L, the length of the matrix. And this is exact. So this allows us to implement Krentel's accounting scheme with a fixed Hamiltonian term by computing, by computing the desired penalty cost and ensuring that the length of the computation is a function of that cost. So the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian corresponds to a computation whose length encodes Krentel's accounting scheme. This is done in the higher order bits, the lower order bits encode the value of the function f. 
So it ensures that the maximum value of this function t corresponds to the correct oracle responses. The length of the computation is just a multiple of this function t. And the longer the computation, the smaller the eigenvalue. So if we can determine this minimum eigenvalue with enough precision, we can uncover L max, from which we can recover the value of the function using the correct oracle responses, which is the true value of f of x. So I'd like to close with an open problem illustrating the difficulty that we encountered in proving type results. So this is simply a function version of the local Hamiltonian problem, no longer translation invariant on finite systems. The input is just a local Hamiltonian and n qubits, and we're asking for an approximation of the ground energy. So it's not too hard to see that function local Hamiltonian can be solved in FP to the QMA using the same binary search technique that we talked about earlier. But how would you show hardness? So typically a hardness result is gonna have this reduction structure where you take an arbitrary function in FP to the QMA, and you have to encode that in an instance of function local Hamiltonian. So you take your input X, you produce by the, the reduction a local Hamiltonian H of X, and somehow the ground energy of H of X encodes the value of the function F on input X. And typically the way a construction like this would go is that you would check yes oracle responses by simulating a quantum verifier and having some energy penalty for rejection. The problem is if the polynomial time Turing machine makes an invalid oracle query, the probability of acceptance is completely uncontrolled. And as a result, the energy of the Hamiltonian is completely uncontrolled. And it's difficult to imagine how you encode the value of the function f on input x into the value of this minimum ground energy if the minimum ground energy is a completely uncontrolled quantity. So um, I'll close with that. Thank you very much. And I encourage you, if you're interested in more details, to refer to the archive version of the paper.